Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the conservation laws and in this lecture, we will have a look at the Forest Conservation Act 1980. Now, when you look at this act, you will find that it is a very small act. It does not have a large number of sections. The preamble also is very short. But this act is considered to be one of the most powerful acts when it comes to the conservation of the forest resources in the country. Now, why was this act enacted? Why was this law made? It was made because the central government observed that a large chunk of the forests of the country were getting diverted for n number of reasons. So, for instance, for any developmental activity, people would take up a chunk of forest. If people wanted to settle local inhabitants into some areas, they would cut down the trees and convert that area into a residential property. Forests were also being diverted for agriculture, for giving pattas to people. So there were n number of reasons because of which the forests of the country were getting diverted. And to stop those diversions, to put an end to those diversions, this act was promulgated. So when we look at the preamble of this act, it says an act to provide for the conservation of forests and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental thereto. An act to provide for the conservation of forests. What is the objective of this act? To conserve the forests and to provide for matters connected therewith. So when we say provide for matters connected therewith, it means to provide for certain procedures for the conservation of forests or ancillary or incidental thereto be it enacted by the parliament in the 31st year of the Republic of India as follows. As simple preamble as this. Then section 1 is short title extent and commencement. So what is the name of the act? This act may be called the Forest Conservation Act 1980. In short, we also refer to it as the FCA 1980 Forest Conservation Act. So that is the short title. Extent it extends to the whole of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So this is what the act said in original, but then section 95.1 of the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019 said that section 19, uh, say, uh, section 95.1, all central laws in table 1 of the fifth schedule to this act on and from the appointed day shall apply in the manner as provided therein to the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Union Territory of Ladakh. And then if you look at the fifth schedule, table 1, serial number 28, it says the Forest Conservation Act 1980 in subsection 2 of section 1, words except the state of Jammu and Kashmir shall be omitted. So with this act in 2019, the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, it made change to the uh, section 1, subsection 2, it extends to the whole of India and rest of the words have been omitted now. So now it extends to the whole of India. And it shall be deemed to have come into force on the 25th day of October 1980. So when does this act commence? It commenced on 25th of October 1980. Now section 2 here is different. In most of the acts, section 2 deals with definitions, but here we do not have those definitions. So section 2 says, restriction on the de-reservation of forest or use of forest land for non-forest purposes. So it is putting a restriction on the de-reservation of forest because earlier people were doing a de-reservation of forest. So um, different state governments were saying that from such and such date, these forests are no longer reserved or they were using forest land for non-forest purpose, such as 
making habitations, making agricultural lands, giving agricultural pattas, mining, industry, n number of things. And this section 2 is putting a restriction to both of these activities, de-reservation of forest and use of forest land for non-forest purpose. Now, you will also remember that when we were talking about the Indian Forest Act, then the Indian Forest Act of 1927 also provided for the de-reservation of reserve forests. Now, because that act, the Indian Forest Act of 1927, it was promulgated in 1927 and this act came in 1980. So, the provisions of this act are overruling the provisions of the Indian Forest Act of 1927. So, even though the Indian Forest Act of 1927 provides for de-reservation of the reserve forest, these restrictions have now kicked in after 1980. So, it says not withstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force in a state, no state government or other authority shall make except with the prior approval of the central government any order that any reserve forest within the meaning of the expression reserve forest in any law for the time being in force in that state or any portion thereof shall cease to be reserved. So, what it is saying? Notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force. So, even though the Indian Forest Act is providing for these powers, notwithstanding anything contained in that or in similar other legislations notwithstanding any powers that have been given through any of the acts, no state government or other authority shall make except with the prior approval of the central government these orders. So, even today forests can be de-reserved, but the state government cannot take this decision unilaterally. It has to take a prior approval of the central government for things like de-reservation of a forest, that any reserve forest within the meaning of the expression reserve forest in any law for the time being in force in that state or any portion thereof. So, even if you want to de-reserve a small portion of a big forest block, reserve forest block, you need to have prior approval of the central government, shall cease to be reserved. Second, that any forest land or any portion thereof may be used for any non-forest purpose. So, now if the state government wants to use a forest land or any portion of a forest land for a non-forest purpose, they require a prior approval of the central government. Third, that any forest land or any portion thereof may be assigned by way of lease or otherwise to any private person or to any authority, corporation, agency or any other organization not owned, managed or controlled by the government. So, this clause is now saying that any forest land or portion thereof may be assigned by, by way of lease or otherwise. So, as we saw before, before this law came into existence, people or the politicians were giving pattas that is the leases on forest land for agricultural purposes or for habitation purposes. Now, this clause is putting a check to that. If the state government wants to assign by way of lease or otherwise, that is by way of sale, by way of donation, by any means, any forest land or a portion to a private person or to any authority, corporation, agency or any other organization not owned, managed or controlled by the government, then prior permission of the central government is now essential. And fourth, that any forest land or any portion thereof may be cleared of trees which have grown naturally in that land or portion for the purpose of using it for reforestation. Now, what is this provision referring to? Earlier, a large number of state governments did this. They cleared off the naturally occurring forests in their areas and then they planted those trees that were having commercial importance. So, for example, a natural mixed forest comprising of n number of species would be clear filled and then planted with trees such as teak or wattle because they were having commercial importance. Now, this clause is putting restrictions to that. So, this clause is saying 
that any forest land or any portion thereof may be cleared of trees which have grown naturally in that land or portion for the purpose of using it for reforestation. If any state government wants to do this, they need to take prior permission of the central government. Then the explanation says for the purpose of this section, non-forest purpose means the breaking up or clearing of any forest land or portion thereof. So, breaking up of land and clearing of any forest land for things like the cultivation of tea, coffee, spices, rubber, palms, oil bearing plants, horticultural crops or medicinal plants. So, even if you are clearing up a forest land and growing rubber trees or palm trees, so even though these are trees, then too it will be called a non-forestry purpose because you are now not using the forest for forestry purpose, but you are using it for these agricultural purposes or any purpose other than a forest uh, that reforestation, but does not include any work relating or ancillary to conservation, development and management of forests and wildlife, namely the establishment of check post, fire lines, wireless communications and construction of fencing, bridges and culverts, dams, water holes, trench marks, boundary marks pipelines or other like purposes. So, it is saying any purpose other than reforestation will also count as a non-forestry purpose, but non-forestry purpose does not include these things because for the management of forest, for the scientific management of forest for silviculture, culture, you also need to do certain things. You might need to put up boundary pillars, you might need to set up certain fencing. Uh, in certain areas, you might need to mark certain trees, you might need to construct roads in certain areas or dams or culverts or check dams. So, all of these activities that are a part of normal forestry operations, they are not banned or for that you do not need to take permission of the central government. So, it says it does not include any work relating to or ancillary to conservation, development and management of forests and wildlife. So, things like establishment of check posts because a check post is necessary for the protection of the forest areas. In a check post, we normally check if a vehicle is carrying timber or forest produce and in these check posts, it is ascertained that any timber or forest produce that is being extracted or carried has been extracted through legal means and not illegally. Construction of fire lines. Now, what are fire lines? In a forest, if you have a forest fire in one area, then because the whole of the forest is made up of combustible materials in the form of trees and timber, so the fire can spread from one area to another area. Now, to stop that, to check that, what we do is we clear certain areas in the form of fire lines. So, fire lines are very much like a road. So, you will have um, a stretch of the forest that has been cleared and we do not permit any vegetation to grow in that stretch. So, every year this area will be cleared off. So, if any uh, plants are coming up in that area, they will be cleared off. So, that whenever you have a fire, the fire when it reaches a fire line, it finds a, an area where there is no combustible material and so the fire has to stop there. It cannot move in uh, the dearth of a combustible material. So, construction of a fire line can be done, you do not need to have a, perm a prior permission from the central government. It is not included in a non-forestry activity. So, fire lines are forestry activities. Wireless communications and construction of fencing, bridges and culverts. So, you need to fence certain areas. So, for example, if you have planted trees in an area, then that area might need to be fenced so that animals do not graze upon these plants and they have a chance to reach greater heights. Or in certain areas where there are a large number of cattle, then also the forest department might set up fencing so that the cattle from the nearby villages do not enter into the forest areas and eat up everything. Now, setting up of this fencing, constructing a fencing is a forestry activity. It is not a non-forestry activity. So, for this you do not require a prior permission of the central government. Bridges and culverts. Now, bridges are essential for 
the movement of the forest staff in the forest areas. Culverts again provide for the movement of water. Dams, water holes. Now, dams and water holes are generally set up to provide water to the wild animals. So, they are water sources. Trench marks, boundary marks, pipelines or other like purposes, they are forestry activities and for these you do not require a prior permission of the central government. Then section 2A from the name itself, it suggests that 2A was added later on, it is an addition, it was not there in the original act. Appeal to National Green Tribunal, any person aggrieved by an order or decision of the state government or other authority made under section 2 on or after the commencement of the National Green Tribunal Act of 2010 may file an appeal to the National Green Tribunal established under section 3 of the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 in accordance with the provisions of that act. So, if somebody is feeling aggrieved by a decision taken under section 2, they may appeal against that decision to the NGT is what this section is saying. Then section 3, constitution of advisory committee. The central government may constitute a committee consisting of such number of persons as it may deem fit to advise that government with regard to the grant of approval under section 2. So, if the state government is asking for a prior approval, then should that approval be granted or not? Who is going to decide that? The central government is going to decide that. But in taking this decision, it might require the opinions or inputs of different experts. And for that, the act is providing for an advisory committee to provide advice to the central government. And the central government may constitute a committee. So, the committee is constituted by the central government. It consists of such number of persons as the central government may deem fit. So, it is not putting a restriction on that and the purpose is to advise the central government with regard to grant of approval under section 2 and any other matter connected with conservation of forests which may be referred to it by the central government. So, any other matter can also be referred to the advisory committee for their opinion and advice. Section 3A talks about penalty, penalty for contravention of the provisions of the act. Whoever contravenes or abets the contravention of any of the provisions of section 2 shall be punishable with simple imprisonment for a period which may extend to 15 days. So, contravention of the provision as well as abetment of the contravention, both are punishable with the same penalty. And the punishment is very simple, it is a simple imprisonment, it is not a rigorous imprisonment and for a period which may extend to 15 days. So, if you look at the face of it, it does not appear to be a very stringent punishment. But then if you look at section 2, then who can violate section 2? It turns out that in, uh, in all the cases, the officers of the government are going to be involved. And so, this is one of those acts that is putting a liability to the primarily on the officers. Because if a contractor is doing something, if a businessman is doing something to the forest, then they will be dealt with under the Indian Forest Act. Because they do not have the power to de-reserve a forest. They do not have the power to give the forest on lease to a person. They do not have the power to permit the use of a forest plant for a non-forestry purpose. Who has these powers? These powers are with the bureaucrats and these powers are with the politicians. So, this is one act that is putting the primary blame or the primary culpability on the bureaucrats and the politicians. And what happens if a bureaucrat gets a simple imprisonment for up to 15 days? Well, the first thing that happens is that there is a deemed suspension. So, that bureaucrat will be suspended and put on a departmental inquiry. So, because of that reason, even a simple imprisonment for 15 days becomes a very big punishment. So, the punishment here is simple imprisonment for a period which may extend to 15 days and that is it. No fine, 
no regress imprisonment, no long term imprisonment. Then section 3b says offences by the authorities and government departments. So when authorities are involved and government departments are involved, what will happen? Where any offence under this act has been committed by any department of government, the head of, the of that department is liable. And by any authority, every person who at the time the offence was committed was directly in charge of and was responsible to the authority for the conduct of the business of the authority as well as the authority shall be deemed to be guilty of the offence and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. So this again becomes a very big threat. Why? Because if anybody in the department is contravening this act, the head of the department is held liable. If anybody in the authority is contravening the provisions, the head of the authority as well as the authority. So the head at that particular point of time plus the authority meaning the current head might also be involved here. So this is what it is saying. When any, any offence under this act has been committed by any department of the government, the head of the department and by any authority, every person who at the time the offence was committed was directly in charge of and was responsible to the authority for the conduct of the business of the authority as well as the authority. So there will be a liability on the authority as well, shall be deemed to be guilty of the offence and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly, provided that, so now there is a saving clause provided that nothing contained in this subsection shall render the head of the department or any person referred to in clause B liable to any punishment if he proves that the offence was committed without his knowledge or that he exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. So when can people uh, avoid liability? If they are able to prove that the offence was committed without their knowledge. And this becomes very difficult because in a large number of cases, when these big decisions are being taken, then the file would invariably go to the head of the department. One or more letters would have all have invariably gone to the head of the department. So it is very difficult for the head of the department to say that I did not know about it. And similarly, it says the second saving clause is that or that he exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. Now what is all due diligence? All due di diligence means that the, the head of the department had taken all the precautions that he could have taken, which includes among others giving training to people. So whenever such activities are going on, did the head of the department give training to all the subordinate staff that this is the act and you should not be contravening this act? Did he arrange for any refresher courses? Did he set up an example? So if somebody was uh, doing something wrong, did he send a letter to that person? So all of these things have to be followed and so it becomes very difficult for the head of the department to avoid the liability. Then subsection 2 says, notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1, where an offence punishable under the act has been committed by a department of government or any authority referred to in clause B of subsection 1, and it is proved that the offence has been committed with the consent or connivance. Consent meaning that somebody else had also said that yes, it should be done in this way. This forest should be diverted without taking permission of the central government. So that would be a consent or connivance, meaning that somebody else was also involved. So somebody else who prepared the file to be, uh, to be signed in this way or somebody who wrote in the note sheet in a way that it became confusing for the person who gave the, uh, the signature. So if it is proved that the offence has been committed with the consent or connivance of or is attributable to any neglect on the part of any officer. 
So even if you are not checking the files properly, even if you have neglected to give sufficient attention, here too you become liable on the part of any officer other than the head of the department or in the case of an authority, any person other than the persons referred to in clause B of subsection 1, such officer or persons shall also be deemed to be guilty of that offence and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. So, this section has now expanded the net of liability. So, who all will be held liable? The head of the department or the head of the authority, the authority and any person also who gave his consent or was involved had a connivance or had done certain neglect because of which there was this contravention. So, all of these people are held liable and all of these may be given a simple imprisonment up to 15 days. And so, all of these people can be deemed to be suspended and a departmental inquiry can be, in, can be initiated against all of these. So, this is why this act becomes so powerful. And in section 3, we, we saw that offences by government departments and authorities and you will not find any offences by private parties in the whole of the act. Now, section 4 deals with power to make rules. The central government may by notification in the official gazette make rules for carrying out the provisions of this act. So, who can make rules? The central government, not the state government and these rules have to be notified in the official gazette. Every rule made under this act shall be laid as soon as may be after it is made before each house of parliament while it is in session for a total period of 30 days, which may be comprised in one session or in two or more successive sessions and if before the expiry of the session immediately following the session or the successive sessions aforesaid, both houses agree in making any modification in the rule or both houses agree that the rule should not be made, the rule shall thereafter have effect only in such modified form or be of no effect as the case may be. So, however, that any such modification or annulment shall be without prejudice to the validity of anything previously done under that rule. Meaning that the central government can make rules, they have to be notified in the official gazette, but then they also have to be put in the parliament for at least 30 days. So, the legislators, the uh, the representatives of the people, they have the opportunity to look at what rules the central government has made. And if the parliament agrees that these rules should not be made, then these rules will not be made. They will not have any effect from that day onwards. If the parliament agrees that there should be such and such modifications to the rules, then there would be those modifications in the rules from that day onwards. With the caveat, that anything that was done before that particular day, it will not be affected. So, here as well, the representatives of the people, the members of parliament, they have the final say, they can change the rules. So, the central government makes the rules, but the parliament can change or it can say that no, this rule should not be made. Then section 5 talks about repeal and saving. The Forest Conservation Ordinance 1980 is hereby replaced. So, if you look at uh, the historical perspective, before the Forest Conservation Act, we had the Forest Conservation Ordinance in 1980, meaning that the government found it to be so crucial, so urgent that it could not wait for the parliament to be in session. So, that was the kind of urgency that the government was feeling by looking at the rate at which the forests were getting diverted and notwithstanding in such repeal, Anything done or any action taken under the provisions of the said ordinance shall be deemed to have been done or taken under the corresponding provisions of this act. And that is the end of it, as short and simple act as this. Now, in this context, the courts have given different rulings. The Honorable Supreme Court of India in Ambika Query works in another versus the state of Gujarat said that. Here, the case of the appellants is that they have invested large sums of money in mining operations. So, we have this Ambika query and query is a mine. So, basically the appellants 
have invested a large amount of money in the mining operations. And so the appellants are saying that it is the duty of the authorities that the power of granting permission should have been so exercised that the appellants had the full benefits of their investment. So the appellant are saying that because we have already invested so much of money after taking the first permission, so now if when the point of granting permission comes, then you should grant permission in such a way that we are able to take benefits of our investments, meaning that you should give us the permission. It was emphasized that none of the appellants had committed any breach of the terms of grant nor were there any factors disentitling them to such renewal. While there was power to grant renewal and in these cases there were clauses permitting renewals, it might have cast a duty to grant such renewal in the facts and circumstances of the cases, especially in view of the investments made by the appellants in the areas covered by the querying leases. But renewals cannot be claimed as a matter of right for the following reasons. So, in this case, Ambika Query Works were asking for their permission to be renewed, and the Supreme Court is saying that their argument that because we have invested a large amount of money, so it should be renewed, that is that cannot be claimed as a matter of right. And why? Because the rules dealt with a situation prior to the coming into operation of the 1980 Act, that is the FCA. 1980 Act was an act in recognition of the awareness that deforestation and ecological imbalances as a result of deforestation have become social menaces and further deforestation and ecological imbalances should be prevented. So, even though before this act there was a, a provision that they, uh, that they could easily get renewals, but after this act things have changed because this act was made in recognition of the awareness. People became aware that deforestation and ecological imbalances because of deforestation have become so social menaces. Because a large part of the society is now uh, getting the brunt of it and further deforestation and ecological imbalances should be prevented. That was the primary purpose uh, writ large in the Act of 1980. So, this is the purpose that was written in the Act of 1980. Therefore, the concept that power coupled with the duty enjoined upon the respondents to renew the lease stands eroded by the mandate of legislation as manifest in the 1980 Act in the facts and circumstances of these cases. The primary duty was to the community and that duty took precedence in our opinion in these cases. Meaning that whenever a new law is made, then people who would uh, not have received the prior benefits, they have the liberty to approach the court. But here the court is saying that after the awareness came, after this law was made, the 1980 act was passed, after this you cannot hold as a right that the permission should be renewed because that mandate stands eroded and the obligation of the society must predominate over the obligation to the individuals. So, this act of 1980, the Forest Conservation Act is an obligation to the society. So, it is serving the needs of the society because of which this act was made and this serving of the needs of the society must predominate, it should have precedence over the obligation to the individuals, in this case Ambika Query Works and another. Similarly, the Honorable Supreme Court in the Union of India and others versus Kamath Holiday Resorts Private Limited in 96 said this, since the area leased out to the respondent was within a union territory, the collector apparently entertained the view that observance of the procedure under section 2 of the Forest Conservation Act 1980 was not necessary. Because when we look at section 2, it talks about the state government and the collector was of the view that because this is a union territory and so the procedure under section 2 is not necessary, the administration being of the central government. But the conservator of forests strongly held the opposite view and put to stop further activities of the respondent. So, here we are observing a clash between the collector and the conservator of forests. 
the collector was saying that because this is a union territory and so we do not need to follow the provisions of this act because this is not a state government. The conservator was saying that no, after this act was passed, everything has to go to the central government. So what does the Supreme Court say? The respondent was thus led to move the High Court of Bombay in writ proceedings contending mainly that the Forest Conservation Act 1980 was in fact meant to involve state governments or other authorities nominated by them and that the act was not meant to apply to union territories as they themselves were governed by the central government. This assertion and interpretation as accepted by the High Court in our view was in the teeth of the clear applicability of the act extending to the whole of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So here the Supreme Court is saying that the High Court agreed with the collector because union territories are under are governed by the central government. They are not under a state government. But then this view of the collector and also that of the High Court of Bombay that was wrong. Why? Because the act is ap uh, because the applicability of the act extends to the whole of India. At that point of time, it was whole of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Today, we will read it as extending to the whole of India. The act was obviously meant to apply to union territories as well and not to the states alone. And so, in this case, it was ruled that even in the case of union territories, uh, these provisions have to be followed. Now, in if you look at these two judgments, we find that in a large number of cases, the courts have to intervene. They have to specify or explain what is actually meant by the act. And to ease this process, because there will be n number of judgments and nobody can be expected to know each and every judgment at all points of time. So, to ease out this process, the government comes up with conservation handbooks. So, you, we have forest conservation handbook of 2019 and which is a compilation all of, of all of these different judgments and of the rules that have been made, of the decisions have been made. And we also have forest conservation rules which are made as per the act. So let us now have a look at this handbook and the forest conservation rules 2022. So this is how these handbooks are issued. So this is a letter from the government of India, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change dated 28th of March and it is written to the principal secretary and secretary of forest of all the states and union territory governments. So now if you look at this letter, it is already referring to the fact that the act is applicable to the union territories. Handbook of guidelines for effective and transparent implementation of the provisions of the Forest Conservation Act. And then this is the handbook, guidelines and clarifications. And this is how the handbook is arranged. So we have the list of abbreviations, the act with the amendments, the forest conservation rules amended up to 2017. Now we have the 2022 rules, so we'll also have a look at that. Then part B is court orders and general clarifications. So what are the court orders in all of these matters and what are the general clarifications regarding those? Then how do we do compensatory afforestation? So what is compensatory afforestation? Under the Forest Conservation Act, if a forest needs to be diverted for a non-forestry purpose, we first of all, we take the net present value of the forest. Because once you divert that forest into a non-forestry purpose, then the forest no longer exists. So what is the value of that forest? That is taken from the user agency. Plus, if they, they are diverting X hectares of the forest, then they should also provide to the forest department X hectares of non-forest land on which the forest department will do a compensatory afforestation. So it will try to compensate for the loss of this forest by doing an afforestation in another area that will be provided by the user agency. In certain cases where the user agency is a government agency, there is also a provision that in place of doing afforestation on the same size of land, you can uh, do uh, rehabilitation of forests of twice the area. Because even uh, in case of the forests that are with the forest department, it is possible that some of those areas might have been degraded over time. 
say because of uh, routine gra grazing of animals in those areas. So, in these cases, the uh, the provision also states that we can do rehabilitation of twice the degraded area. And so, this part B is dealing with these provisions, compensatory afforestation, net present value, general approval under FCA section 2.2 for critical public and strategic defense infrastructure. So, section 2 was saying that the prior approval of the central government is needed. So, the central government has given a general prior, uh, prior approval for critical public infrastructure and for strategic defense infrastructure. For those cases, the files do not have to be sent to the central government because there is already a prior approval. Then it talks about transfer, re-diversion, survey and investigation, mining projects, wind energy, irrigation and hydroelectric projects including catchment area treatment plan, transmission lines, infrastructural projects including roads, railway lines, border roads, critical utility infrastructure, development, residential, building construction, projects in or near protected areas including zoos. So, it deals with all of these different matters. So, if we look at this, these rules, this handbook in detail, uh, then part C also uh, deals with conditions stipulated by the ministry while according prior approval stage 1 or stage 2 for non-forest use of forest land under the Forest uh, Conservation Act 1980. So, let us now have a look at this handbook. What does it talk about? So, you have the abbreviations, then the Forest Conservation Act. So, we have already looked at this act, then the forest conservation rules. We will now look at the 2022 rules. So, let us skip this. Then these are the appendices. So, form A. So, uh, this will be a part of the rules. So, let us also uh, basically you will get an idea about how these applications are made. Form for seeking prior approval under section 2 of the proposals by the state government and other authorities. Part 1 to be filled by the user agency. So, the, the agency that wants to divert the forest lands or use the forest lands for non-forestry purpose that they will be filling this up. Project details, short narrative of the proposal and project or scheme for which the forest land is required, map showing the required forest land, boundary of adjoining forest on a 1 is to 50,000 scale map, cost of the project, justification for locating the project in forest area. So, in this case, they will have to justify that there is no other area that is available. It has to be here only, only then in, in only in those cases will the approvals be granted. Then cost benefit analysis, what is the cost of the project, what is the benefit that the society will reach out of it. Then employment likely to be generated, purpose wise breakup of the total land required, details of displacement of people due to the project if any. And when we talk about the details, it asks in detail about the number of families that will be displaced, the number of scheduled castes and scheduled tribe families that will be displaced, the rehabilitation plan. So, before even applying, you need to have a rehabilitation plan. Whether clearance under the Environment Protection Act 1986 is required or not, and undertaking to bear the cost of raising and maintenance of compensatory afforestation and or penal compensatory afforestation as well as cost for protection and regeneration of safety zone etc as per the scheme prepared by the state government. So, they have to give this undertaking that they are ready to bear the cost of raising the compensatory afforestation, maintaining the compensatory afforestation and or any penal compensatory afforestation if it comes up and the cost of protection and regeneration of safety zone. Then details of certificates or documents enclosed as required under the instructions. So, this is how the proposal will come up. Then the nodal officer of the state will put up the state serial number of the proposal because it has to go through the state. Then you have part 2 which is to be filled up by the concerned deputy conservator of forest or the DCF. Typically, it means the DFO of the area. So, it says state serial number of the proposal, it will come from there. So, now certain things have to be filled up by the forest officer, the DFO of the area and a few of these things might look like repetitions, but 
nonetheless they have to be filled because if there is any variation then that will be picked up by the central agencies. So, location of the project or scheme, the state or union territory, district, forest division, area of forest land proposed for diversion in hectares, legal status of the forest. So, legal status means whether it is a reserve forest, a protected forest, a village forest, an unclassified forest or so on. Density of vegetation, because uh, if the area is very dense, then probably it should not be diverted. And so, the DFO will write about the density of, veg of vegetation. Species wise scientific names and diameter class wise enumeration of trees to be enclosed. In the case of irrigation or hydral projects, enumeration at FRL, FRL 2 meter and FRL 4 meter also to be enclosed. So, what is it asking about? It is asking the DFO to put in the species wise and diameter class wise enumeration of trees. So, in this area, what trees are there? What is the species of each and every individual tree and what is the diameter of that tree? Because that will give you an idea of whether it is a young forest or whether it is a mature forest or whether it is an old forest. And do you have any species that are say very threatened species? So, a list of all individual trees has to be made. Brief note on vulnerability of the forest area to erosion. So, if this area is extremely erosion prone, then maybe certain other steps will have to be taken. Approximate distance of proposed site for diversion from boundary of the forest. Is it on the boundary or is it very deep inside the forest? Weather forms part of national park, wildlife sanctuary, biosphere reserve, tiger reserve, elephant corridor, etc. And if so, the details of the area and the comments of the chief wildlife warden to be annexed whether any rare endangered unique species of flora and fauna are found in the area and if so the details thereof. Rare endangered and unique. Unique typically refers to endemic species which are not found anywhere else. So, species of flora that is plants and fauna that is animals. Whether any protected archaeological or heritage site or defense establishment or any other important monument is located in the area. If so, the details thereof with NOC from competent authority if required. Now, all these things will be filled up by the DFO, not by the user agency, so that the user agency is not able to hide any facts. Whether the requirement of forest land as proposed by the user agency in column 2 of uh, part 1 is unavoidable and barest minimum for the project. If no recommended item uh, area item wise with details of alternatives examined whether any work in violation of the act has been carried out, yes or no. If yes, details of the same including period of work done, action taken on erring officials and whether work in violation is still in progress. Because at times it might happen that even before the prior approval, people start doing the work which is in violation of the act. And so, this point is asking about all the details of any work that has been started without the approval. And so, this can be used later on for punishing those officials. It is already asking about the action taken on erring officials, but then this section can also be used uh, for uh, punishments under the FCA. Details of compensatory afforestation scheme. Details of non-forest area or degraded forest area identified for compensatory afforestation, its distance from adjoining forest, number of patches and size of each patch. So, details about the area that is going to be compensatorily afforested to compensate for this diversion. Map showing non-forest or degraded area identified for compensatory afforestation and adjoining forest boundaries. Detailed compensatory afforestation scheme including species to be planted, implementing agency, time schedule, cost structure, etc. So, all the details about what you are going to plant when you are going to plant, what is going to be the cost of planting these and who is going to plant. Total financial outlay for comp compensatory afforestation scheme. Then certificates from competent authority regarding suitability of area identified for compensatory afforestation and from management point of view to be signed by the concerned DCF. 
site inspection report of the DCF to be enclosed, especially highlighting the facts asked in column 7, 8 and 9 above. So basically, the DCF or the DFO has to actually visit the site and present his report about what he found on that area. Division and district profile, the geographical area of the district, the forest area of the district, total forest area diverted since 1980 with number of cases. Now why is this thing important? This is important because in certain cases, it if you have a single proposal, so if you have a single proposal that says that we want to divert 100 hectares of forest, then you might agree. But if you find out that in actuality already 10,000 hectares of the forest have been diverted and this is this 100 hectare is what was left in that district, so nothing else remains. So if that happens, then there will be a huge amount of soil erosion in that area. There will be practically a decimation of the complete ecosystem. So in this aspect, what the form is asking is the total forest area diverted since 1980 with the number of cases. So that we can look at the cumulative impact of this diversion. Not the impact of the single diversion, but the cumulative in impact of all the diversions that have already happened. Then total compensatory afforestation is stipulated in the district or division since 1980 on forest land including penal compensatory afforestation and non-forest land. Progress of compensatory afforestation as on date on forest land and non-forest land. And specific recommendations of the DCF for acceptance or otherwise of the proposal with reasons. Then it has to be signed. Then after the DCF, it goes to the concerned conservator of forests. And then he has to fill whether site where the forest land involved is located has been inspected by the concerned conservator. If yes, the date of inspection and observations made in a form of inspection note to be enclosed. Whether the concerned CF agrees with the information given in part B and recommendations of the DCF and specific recommendation of the concerned CF for acceptance or otherwise of the proposal with detailed reasons. Then it will go up to the state level and then it part 4 has to be signed to be filled in by the nodal officer or the principal chief conservator of forest or the head of forest force department. So now it is going to the head of the department or his representative who is the nodal officer detailed opinion and specific recommendation of the state forest department for acceptance or otherwise of the proposal with remarks. While giving opinion, the adverse comments made by concerned CF or DCF should be categorically reviewed and critically commented upon. Then it goes to part 5. To be filled in by the secretary in charge of forest department or by any other authorized officer of the state government not below the rank of an undersecretary. So after the department, it has now moved to the government and the secretary has to sign. Recommendation of the state government and adverse comments made by any officer or, or authority in part B or C or part D above should be specifically commented upon. And then it gives you all the different instructions. So basically you will find that it is a very detailed form that has to be filled. Now. This handbook also details about the different court judgments, so court orders and general clarifications. So meaning of forest for the purpose of FCA. So what is a forest? As ordered by the Supreme Court of India in their order of 12th December 1996 in uh, WP number 202 of 1995 in the matter of TN Godavarman Thrumalpad versus Union of India. The word forest must be understood according to its dictionary meaning. This description covers all statutorily recognized forests, whether designated as reserved, protected or otherwise for the purpose of section 2.1 of the Forest Conservation Act. The term forest land occurring in section 2 will not only include forest as understood in the dictionary sense, but also any area recorded as forest in the government record irrespective of ownership. This is how it has to be understood for the purpose of section 2 of the act. So basically, before this definition given by the Supreme Court, 
there was no actual definition of forest. So all these acts are talking about forest, the Indian Forest Act, the Forest Conservation Act, but they do not define a forest. So the Honorable Supreme Court said that forest is to be understood according to its dictionary meaning. And what is the dictionary meaning? A patch of land that has trees, that is a forest. And this, this description covers all statutorily recognized forests, whether RF, PF or otherwise. So all of these are included, but any other piece of land that has trees will also be included. But forest is different from forest land. And forest land not only includes forest as understood in the dictionary sense, but also any area recorded as forest in the government record irrespective of ownership. So even if there is a land that is recorded as a forest, but does not have trees, if you go to that spot, you will not find any trees, you will find a very barren land or probably it has been converted into agriculture. But if it is recorded as a forest in any government record, irrespective of the ownership, so whether the ownership belongs to the government or a private person is immaterial, but all of them will also be included in forest land. So forest land does not just mean a land that is forest, it also means all those lands that have been recorded as forest in any of the government records, irrespective of ownership. So these kinds of clarifications, these kinds of court orders are referred to in this handbook. Then the Lafarge judgment of 2011 and so on. Now let us have a quick look at the uh, rules that are made. So this is the forest conservation rules of 2022. Now, it says in exercise of the powers conferred by subsection 1 of section 4 of the Forest Conservation Act 1980 and in supersession of the Forest Conservation Rules 2003, except as respect of things done or omitted to be done before such supersession, the central government hereby makes the following rules. So we saw that the central government is empowered to make rules and these this is how rules are made. So here again, you will have short title, extent and commencement. You will have the definitions of various things. So this is a long list of definitions. Then constitution of advisory committee. The act said that uh, an advisory committee will be formed by the central government. And now this rule is saying what, who will be a, a member of the advisory committee. So the DG of forest will be the chairperson, ADG of forest conservation will be member, ADG wildlife will be member, additional commissioner of soil conservation will be a member three experts to be nominated by the central government representing one each from the fields of ecology, engineering and developmental economics. They will be the non-official members and the IG of forest dealing with forest conservation will be the member secretary. So this is how the advisory group is formed. Then it talks about the terms and conditions of service, the conduct of business of the advisory committee, the constitution of regional empowered committees or RECs, Conduct of business of the regional empowered committees, how are they going to look into the cases? Constitution of project screening committees, pro proposals for prior approval of the central government. So this is how the proposals will come and so on. Proposal seeking prior approval of the central government for working plan. So uh, in the case of forest working plans, there is another rule. Creation of compensatory afforestation. Then general instructions about this and then it has the schedules, provisions for requirement of land related to compensatory afforestation, how much of land will you have to provide for different cases. Then you have time period of examination of proposals, how much time will it take to say yes or no to any proposal. So this is how these rules are made and they are promulgated. So in short, the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 is a very short act. It deals with matters of conserving forests. It regulates the de-reservation of reserved forests and it regulates the conversion of forests or the use of forests for non-forestry purposes. In this context, a large number of court judgments are relevant and the central government makes rules and it also publishes handbooks for the ease of implementation. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.